morning. Welcome in Jesus' name. As we enter into the season of Lent, we will be meditating upon our Lord's passion, upon what he endured for us and for our salvation. We will be having a Sunday series as well as a midweek series. In our Sunday series, we will be focused on that passion account that was told in prophecy by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 as we consider Jesus as our sacrifice. Let us pray. Jesus, I will ponder now on thy holy passion. With thy spirit me endow for such meditation. Grant that I in love and faith may the image cherish of thy sufferings, pain, and death, that I may not perish. Grant that I may willingly bear with thee my crosses, learning humbleness of thee, peace mid pain and losses. May I give thee love for love. Hear me, O my Savior, that I may in heaven above sing thy praise forever. Amen. We sing our opening hymn. Please follow the order of service as it is printed in our service bulletin. We worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, we are sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and actions. But we are sorry for our transgressions, and pray you of your bountiful mercy to be gracious and merciful unto us. Forgive us for Jesus' sake, renew us by your Spirit, and lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. 
Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We are forgiven. With boldness and confidence, we may approach the throne to find grace to help in time of need. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. On this, the first Sunday in Lent, we are reminded how it was that this horrible condition of sin entered into the world with all of its corrupting consequences, how death came upon us by one man. And we are reminded how in the amazing grace of God, by one man, the Son of God, we are delivered from sin and death. Our epistle lesson for this morning is found, recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans, where we read in the fifth chapter, beginning with the twelfth verse. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death, spread to all men, because all sinned. If by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. We continue with our Passion History, which again is being taken from the book, The Christ of the Gospels. So those that would like to follow along would find copies of those right outside the door. We will begin our reading on page 170. We are reading of the, of the last Passover in the upper room. Next first day of the unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb had to be killed. And the disciples came to Jesus. He sent Peter and John, saying, Go, prepare the Passover for us so we may eat it. Where do you want us to go? The disciples asked him, and prepare for you to eat the Passover. Go into the city, he told his two disciples, and you will meet a man carrying a jar of water. Follow him into the house which he enters and tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, my time is near. I am coming to you to celebrate the Passover. Where is my room in which I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large room upstairs furnished. Prepare for us there. The disciples did as Jesus directed them. They left went into the city and found everything as he had told them, and so they prepared the Passover. In the evening, when the hour had come, he came with the twelve apostles and lay down for the meal. 
I have very much longed to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, he said to them. I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. Take this, he said, and share it. It was during the supper the devil had already put the idea of betraying Jesus into the mind of Judas, the son of Simon from Caria. Jesus knew that the Father had put everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Then the disciples began to quarrel among themselves as to which of them might be considered the greatest. So Jesus rose from supper, laid aside his outer garment, took a towel and tied it around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and started to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel that was tied around him. And so he came to Simon Peter. Lord, Peter asked him, are you going to wash my feet? What I am doing you don't understand now, Jesus answered him. But later you will know. No, Peter told him, you will never wash my feet. If I don't wash you, Jesus answered him, you have no share in me. Lord, Simon Peter told him, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Anyone who has bathed needs only to have his feet washed, Jesus told him. He is clean all over. You are clean, but not all of you. He knew who was betraying him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on his garment, he lay down again. Do you know what I have done to you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because I am that. Now if I, the Lord and the teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you an example so that you will do as I did to you. Let me assure you, a slave is no greater than his master, and a man who is sent is no greater than he who sends him. If you know this, you are happy if you act according to it. The kings of the nations are lords over them, and their rulers call them benefactors. With you, it is different. The greatest among you should become like the youngest, and the one who leads should be like one who serves. Who is greater, the man who lies down to eat or the one who serves him? Isn't it the man who lies down to eat? But I am among you as one who serves. You have stood by me in the troubles that have tested me. As my father has appointed me to be king, so I appoint you to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and you will sit on thrones and rule the twelve tribes of Israel. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But what the Bible says must come true. He who eats my bread has kicked me. From now on I am telling you these things before they happen, so that when they happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. He who receives anyone whom I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. After Jesus had said this, and while they were still lying down and eating, he was deeply troubled. I tell you the truth, he declared. One of you is going to betray me, one who is eating with me. Look, the hand of him who is betraying me is with me on the table. The disciples looked at one another, puzzled and wondering whom he meant. They started to feel very sad and to discuss with one another which of them was going to do this. And they asked him one after another, You don't mean me, Lord? One of the twelve, he answered them. One who is dipping into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man is going away as it has been decreed and written about him, but woe 
to that man who betrays the Son of Man, it would have been better for that man if he had never been born. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was lying close to the bosom of Jesus. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask him whom he might mean. Leaning back where he was against the bosom of Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? I will dip this piece of bread and give it to him, Jesus answered. He is the one. Then he dipped it and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon from Kiriath. You don't mean me, master, asked Judas, who was going to betray him. Yes, he told him. After Judas had taken the piece of bread, Satan went into him. So Jesus told him what you are going to do, do quickly. Why he had said this to him, nobody at the table knew. Some thought that since Judas had the money box, Jesus told him, buy what we need for the festival, or that he should give something to the poor. Right after Judas had taken the piece of bread, he went outside, and it was night. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and in him God is glorified. God will also glorify him in himself. Yes, he will glorify him immediately. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Let us arise and confess our Christian faith with the whole Christian church on earth. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with hymn 369, All Mankind Fell in Adam's Fall. <laughs>
grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our sermon meditation on this first Sunday in Lent is found recorded in the book of the prophet Isaiah where we read in his 53rd chapter beginning with the first verse. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. This is the word of God. Sanctify us, O Lord, through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In Christ Jesus, the servant of the Lord, fellow redeemed, incredible. What does that word imply? It implies that something that took place is so unlikely, so out of step with expectations, so extraordinary that it's just really hard to accept that it could be true. It's incredible. That is the characterization of what we have before us this and every Lenten season, everything about Jesus is incredible. Everything about Jesus, being the promised Messiah, the champion of salvation, the Lord of all the earth, is just so foreign to mankind's expectations. Jesus just doesn't fit the bill. He doesn't fit the mold that the world has for what a Messiah, what a Savior should be like. And then there's the cross. Yes, I know that we have come to look to the cross of Christ with wonder and even adoration. For by faith, we know what was accomplished on that cross, the cross of Christ. But that's not the way the world looked at the cross. You see, that is the disconnect between us and the world. And we thank and praise God that in his grace, we have come to be disconnected from the world and connected to Christ crucified. And that is where our text begins. This is how the Lord introduces this amazing chapter of prophecy concerning his servant who was to come into the world. The Lord asks, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It is by God's grace alone that we have believed the Lord's own report of this wonder of salvation. And by the Spirit opening our understanding, we have seen the mighty arm of the Lord revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, our crucified Savior. However, what happens with us as as we live in faith and year after year review the events surrounding Jesus' passion is that we lose some of that amazement and seeing just how in Incredible, all of this is, this gospel of a crucified Savior. We begin to take it all for granted, dismissing this most amazing truth in all the world with a casual, yeah, I know that. Well, 600 years before Jesus was even born into the world, the Holy Spirit revealed a most stirring picture of Jesus as our sacrifice. This is the theme for our Sunday Lenten meditations this morning and for the next five Sundays after this. Once again, we shall consider what the most amazing individual ever to live on the face of this earth accomplished for us 
and for our salvation. It was nothing more than the most incredible feat of salvation. Something far more than anyone could even imagine was possible. Far beyond anyone's ability to believe. We begin our meditations on our sacrifice by finding in Jesus our lowly sacrifice. Our text reminds us of Jesus' lowly beginnings. In verse 2, the first half of verse 2, we read, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. You know, just imagine the parched earth in the garden and a little tiny plant coming up out of it. And we say, there's no hope for that. What is that? That's Jesus' beginnings. When Isaiah served as prophet, David's descendants still sat upon the throne in Jerusalem. They were still regarded with honor and dignity and glory. However, Isaiah prophesied of judgment befalling Judah when the Babylonians would come and take them all away. And that would appear to be the end of the line of David, that it would be cut down, leaving nothing more than an old dried up stump. Much earlier in his book of prophecy, Isaiah had written of the rise of the Messiah from just such a stump, with the words indicating also this fall of the house of David. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Yes, Jesus was the son of David, just as the people cried out on Palm Sunday. It was to be through Jesus as the Messiah that David's kingdom would present possess that eternal quality which the Lord had promised to King David so long before. However, Jesus' entrance into this world was not the royal entrance that people were looking for, that they expected. It wasn't at all like when the prince and princess in England announced they're going to have another baby and everyone's so excited and all the press is there to announce it to the world. No, when the king of the Jews was born, who took notice? The angels announced it to some shepherds out in the fields. And where did they find this king of the Jews? But lying in a manger, in a stable, the child of a, just a carpenter and his young wife who had come to Bethlehem for the census. There was nothing remarkable to observe. And so it began. A lowly beginning for a great and glorious Savior. A lowly beginning for a mighty King who did indeed rise to win our salvation. He began as a tender plant growing out of a root, a root, a little shoot out of parched, dry ground, so unlikely. And the appearance of the Lord didn't really change as we observe Jesus' lowly presentation to the world. In the second half of verse 2, we read, He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Isaiah's prophecy was the perfect depiction of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was no Absalom, one of the first of David's sons, so handsome with his long hair that he just drew people's attention and devotion with those handsome features. Well, women didn't swoon when young Jesus went walking by in Nazareth. He was just Jesus, son of Joseph, the carpenter, a tradesman. End of story. Jesus' physical appearance didn't attract any attention. He was simply one of those guys in town, 
nothing remarkable, nothing remarkable to be found in Jesus. But then his public ministry began. Then he revealed his glory as the Christ. He healed people, and people sought Jesus out for his miracles. Jesus focused on teaching. He taught in their synagogues, including in his hometown of Nazareth. There they were amazed at his teaching. Luke tells us, so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And yet as Jesus spoke to them, they were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built that they might throw him down over the cliff. You see, this was not the kind of Messiah that they desired. A carpenter didn't fit the bill at all. Oh, but he did. It was just as the scriptures foretold. You see, Jesus was not about impressing people with his physical features or with his physical strength or with his swordsmanship. He preached repentance, declaring that the kingdom of God was at hand. Jesus pointed away from the kingdoms of this world. His kingdom was a spiritual kingdom in which he would rule hearts with his grace, with the gospel, and win for fallen sinners eternal life and salvation. And that tied directly to his lowliness. Recall the words of the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 2, where he reminds us of Jesus' humility and lowliness. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so we see how Isaiah's words of prophecy were fulfilled in Jesus' lowly sufferings and death. In verse 3 we read, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. We already talked about how the rejection began and how his fellow townspeople rejected him. Even the disciples struggled with Jesus' lowliness persisting in their questions about when he would finally establish his kingdom. They were hoping for a worldly realm centered in Jerusalem. It is when we get into Jesus' passion that we see this rejection reach its climax. On the night of the last Passover supper that we read about, Jesus warned his disciples that all would be offended because of him. They insisted that they would never, ever turn away and desert Jesus. Peter even insisted that he would die with the Lord before that happened. And the Lord warned Peter that before that night was over, he would deny him three times. All of it happened. When Jesus was arrested, they all forsook him and fled. We find Peter following after them and entering into the courtyard of the high priest's palace, a place he had no business being, placing himself in the way of temptation. And when he was asked about Jesus, what happened? You know, he denied. And when they persisted, he denied again. And when he was asked again with 
curses he denied yet again. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and we did not esteem him. Then the trial before Pilate began, and there were no longer crowds crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, as they had done on Palm Sunday. Now it was a mob screaming, crucify him, crucify him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. They falsely accused him. They demanded he be condemned. So Pilate ordered that Jesus be scourged, a cruel, torturous punishment that tore the flesh from a man's back right down to the bone. The crown of thorns was pressed down hard upon his brow. He was dressed in an old purple robe and set out before the people a pathetic sight. It had to be a pitiful sight. Even Pontius Pilate thought it would draw some sympathy from the crowds. It was enough to cause heads to turn away. The sight of Jesus by this point would have been difficult to see. Difficult to look at without becoming ill. And the crowds screamed, Crucify! Crucify! And yet the depth of grief was yet to come. His deepest sorrow would come in the dark hours of God forsakenness, a grief no other living human being can comprehend or even relate to that grief of God forsaking his son, his only begotten son, of whom he had declared in him, I am well pleased. Tell me, ye who hear him groaning, was there ever grief like his? Friends, through fear, his cause disowning, foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him, none would interpose to save, but the deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. And so we begin our review of Jesus' passion. It is incredible. It is more than any man can truly comprehend. The Spirit says, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you see the power of God in this lowly servant of the Lord? in his lowly sacrifice? Do you believe the Lord's report? Praise God that his Holy Spirit has led us to know Jesus and the lowly sacrifice that he has made that we might have life in his name. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, the world by its many sins has kindled the fires of your wrath, and no man, be he ever so perfect, can rob death of its sting nor hell of its terror. 
And that, though are we are by nature the children of wrath, you loved us with such a great love that you did not spare your own Son, but gave him up for us all. You sent him here in our likeness to do for us what we ourselves could not do, that is, give you a perfect ransom for our sins. Or receive our prayers by which we confess our many sins and humbly ask your pardon. Accept also our prayer of praise and thanks for providing us with a perfect salvation through your Son. Dearest Jesus, it is indeed holy ground upon which we in spirit stand to view your cross. For there you endured God's wrath and justice against our sins, suffering and dying for us. We thank you that when you appeared in your first advent to this wicked world, you came not as judge to condemn, but as savior to save. In our dying hour, nothing can comfort us but the blood you shed in our behalf. While we live, there is no treasure we can desire to equal the treasure of salvation you won for us and now offer in your word. Nothing we achieve in this world can begin to compare with the redemption you accomplished for us. There are no earthly relationships we can mean as much to us as having you as friend and savior. We praise you, precious redeemer. O Holy Spirit, light divine, enter our hearts with your blessings and abide there. Take away any trust we may have in our own righteousness and lead us always to make sincere confession of our sins and unworthiness. Fill us with a steadfast faith continually to trust all that Christ has done for our salvation. And when he comes to judge the world, may he count us as God's children and heirs of eternal life. In this Lenten season, may our Savior and his sacrifice on the cross occupy our thoughts, so that through solemn meditation, our faith may be greatly strengthened, and we may acquire a new sense of devotion to our Christian duties. Help us to live Christ, to confess his holy name, to abide by his word, to follow wherever he leads, and to bear our crosses patiently. All of this we ask in his holy name. Amen. And we join in praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. nor alms, nor deeds that I have done can for a single sin atone. To Calvary alone I flee. O oh God, be merciful to me. Yet take this gift from what I own, I would hereby my love make known. My love for you who ransomed me, that I your own dear child might be. Amen. We continue with the first five verses of hymn 143. O oh, dearest Jesus, what law hast thou broken?
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. We close with verses 1 and 10 of hymn 377. Please be seated. Um, a couple of announcements. Right after the service this morning, there will be a brief ladies' aid meeting since they weren't able to have their meeting last Wednesday in conjunction with our, um, our midweek service. Plans are being made for uh, hosting the, um, the uh, Emmanuel Tour Choir, which will be coming here on March 18th. Um, 
Secondly, Bible class will then follow after that brief meeting. Uh, regarding our, our Wednesday service this coming Wednesday, since we did not have our Ash Wednesday service with, with the Lord's Supper, we will have the, uh, communion with um, this Wednesday evening service. And please note that we have soup and sandwich suppers uh, scheduled for these Wednesdays also, and a sign-up sheet for those who are willing to volunteer to prepare one of those meals can be found on the mailbox table in the narthex. Um, I guess I just want to emphasize March 18th, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, is when we will be hosting the, the tour choir. So I hope that... Uh, all of us and many visitors, invite people, invite other members that we haven't seen here for a while. Let's try and uh, fill our pews for this very special event. Are there any other announcements that should be made at this time? The peace of the Lord be with you all. Mm -hmm.